In this episode, let's examine the c -sharp job system, which makes it easier to write multi-threaded code. Though the job system is separate from ECS, they complement each other nicely, and together with the Burst compiler, they form what we know as DOTS, the data-oriented tech stack. Let's go over a bare bones use case so you can just get the hang of writing quote unquote Javified code. Then you'll be able to split your game logic into small discrete parts, which the C -sharp job system can run on more than one CPU thread. For the most part, this will be a pretty basic walkthrough. I'll demo this in as visual a way as I can but we are talking about a pure reorganization of how we script. And we'll demo the non-ECS syntax here so you can apply it to any project even if you're not working in ECS. If you're just joining us, what we'll do here is actually separate from the previous videos. In this episode, you'll just work in a brand new project. I do recommend that you use Unity 2019.3 or higher. It should come with a default installation of the jobs package, but just to be sure, you might want to go to the package manager, find the jobs package, and verify you're using the latest. Modern CPUs contain multiple processing cores. To take advantage of those extra cores, your code needs to support multi-threading. The c -sharp job system is Unity's answer to that. Unity has historically been single-threaded. One instruction goes into the CPU, one result comes out. This is similar to handling everything in a single file line, one calculation after another. The general idea behind multi-threaded programming is that your application can create several lines of instructions to the CPU. It still has that one main thread of execution, but if you're using a multi-core CPU, and just about every modern CPU uses multiple cores, you can create additional threads called worker threads. Those run in the background to offload other tasks. The trick is breaking your logic up so it can work efficiently in parallel across these multiple threads of execution. In game development, where ideally we're going for 30 to 60 or more frames per second, no task at runtime really takes that long to calculate. Though there are different approaches to multi-threaded programming, to process lots of short calculations over multiple threads, Unity uses what they call a job system. Your logic gets broken into smaller tasks called jobs. You put those jobs into a queue, and then you have a pool of worker threads that can draw from that queue and process the data. One issue with a job system is that it has to be built to avoid race conditions. If you have two jobs reading and writing to the same location in memory, they could potentially step over one another, creating inconsistent results. In this very simple example, here are two jobs reading from and writing to the same shared piece of memory. Now, because of timing or just how the jobs begin, they both read the same starting data, a value of zero. They perform a simple operation on that data, just incrementing the value by one, and then they attempt to write back to the same location. Because one task has interrupted the other, the result is incorrect, or at least unexpected on this run through. Now it's possible we do get the correct value of two on another run, but that's why you'll hear people say this is non-deterministic behavior. And that's just a fancy way of saying it's not good. Our results shouldn't be determined by the timing of how the jobs get picked up. They shouldn't be interrupting each other like in this example and probably shouldn't be reading and writing to the same location while doing their computations. In order to avoid this issue, Unity has implemented its job system with a number of safeties built in. It forces each job to use a copy of the data that it needs. Now in this way, one job won't step on another as it computes, and it writes the data out to a different location that is available to the main thread and the other worker threads. There is a scheduling system that allows you to find a dependency between jobs so you can order them without interrupting one another. And again, the next job then works on a copy of its own data and then writes back to that shared location. In order to make this process work efficiently, Unity limits what types of data can be passed in and out of jobs. The data in is what we call blittable in c -sharp. essentially value types like bytes, ints, floating points, simpler data types. You generally can't have reference types to other objects or more complex pieces of data. Now having each job work on a copy of its respective data 
gives that job system some safety. And that's great for avoiding race conditions. But to send the data out of each job, you'll need to store that in a piece of shared memory. To do that, Unity has created something called native containers. And you get those from a resource, unity.collections. And it has several types of native containers available. There's native list, a native array, native hash map, like a dictionary and a native queue. And they work similar to their analogous .NET counterparts. The only major difference is that you are responsible for managing the memory. So you need to worry about allocating space for your native container when you create it. And you also need to dispose of the memory when you're done with it. So allocate and dispose, allocate and dispose. And let's just see all this in an example. Make a new c -sharp file in your project. I'll just call mine example. Not the most original name, but it'll do. Edit the script. And for our assembly definitions at the top, let's begin by adding using unity.jobs. And also we want to use native containers. So we're going to add using unity.collections. Now we won't be using ECS in this episode, just plain old mono behaviors, but we can ditch the update method. We really just need start. So we have some place to kick off our script. And let's define a method called do example. It can be private and return nothing. It takes no arguments. And let's invoke that straight away in the start method. Everything in this script by default, just about everything that you normally associate with the mono behavior runs on the main thread of execution. And that's just a virtual path through your CPU that can handle a set of instructions. You can think of it as a lane in a highway. To offload part of your logic onto one of the other lanes or worker threads, we need to reorganize our code and set up a job. A job in C-sharp is a struct that implements the iJob interface. First, you create a separate struct that implements iJob like this. It can be private and just enclosed within the example class in this case, but it doesn't have to be. Any struct that implements iJob can be part of the C-sharp job system. Put it in a separate file, make it public, whatever you want. I'm going to call mine simple job. It currently highlights in red, and that's because the iJob requires an execute method. We can let the compiler fix this for us, implement interface, and then that creates a public void execute. Go ahead and clear out the not implemented exception. Inside of the execute goes all of the logic for the job. For the rest of the struct, we can declare some public variables used for passing data in and out. So I will declare a float, public float, I'll call it A, and this is for passing a number in. Remember the fields have to be blittable, bytes, floats, integers, stuff like that. We'll use this to initialize our struct and then give it the data it needs to do its work. The other type of field you could expose in here is a native container. And this is how we're going to send the results of our job out. So in this case, I'll have a native array of floats and let's just call this result. Each struct implements the logic in the execute method as we've already mentioned. If you needed to do some complex pathfinding, calculate trajectories, you could do that here. Anything that can be contained in a small functional unit of logic can be packaged in execute. In this case, I'm going to make mine as simple as possible. Let's just store the float A in the first element of the native array. Result zero equals A. Yep, that's it. And that's how we're going to declare our job, simple job. We've defined a job. To use it, you have to follow these steps. First, you need to instantiate a job. Then you need to initialize the instance with some data to work with. And then you need to schedule the job. Instantiate, initialize, and schedule. And let's flesh this out within the do example method. First, we instantiate the job, simple job. I'll call it my job equals a new simple job. Okay, easy. Then we initialize the instance of the job with values. Let's arbitrarily assign my job a to a value of say five. And the result will be stored in a native container. In this case, my job result, we can assign to a new native array. It'll be a native array of floats. And then we specify the number of elements in this array. So just one in this case. And because it's a native container, 
we need to allocate memory. The second argument is the allocator, and you can choose between any of these options. You probably will use temp, temp job, or persistent, depending on how long you need to use the memory. Temp lasts for one frame, temp job lasts for the duration of the job up to four frames, and persistent can last as long as you need it. Temp job should work fine, so we'll choose that. You optionally could use the object initializer syntax with curly braces to instantiate my job and set its values all in one go. So like this, you would just make a new simple job in curly braces, a equals five, and result equals the new native array stuff in here. And that works as well. You might also want to declare the native array on a separate line, native array float, and I'll just call this result array equals a new native array of floats, one allocator temp job. I'll just make this result array, and that's fairly common as well. This way, it's a little bit easier to access the array, but they're functionally equivalent. Just pick whichever way suits you. Once our job has data, we need to place it in the job queue, and you do that by invoking schedule. My job dot schedule, and this returns what's called a job handle. We can store our job handle so we can use it later. Job handle, and I'll call it handle equals my job schedule. The job handle is important because we'll use this to make sure our job is done. And it's also used to schedule jobs that are dependent on each other. And we'll see that in a little bit. So just hang on to that thought. Now at this point, you might need to do some extra stuff in here. So I'll just make a comment, do some other stuff in the main thread. Remember, everything in the modern behavior proper is running on the main thread. Anything not explicitly broken off into a job. Now, somewhere down here, you take that job handle and you wait for it to complete. So I'll just put handle.complete. You normally wouldn't invoke complete right away. You would schedule other jobs or tasks in between, things that you want to do in parallel. Now, I don't have anything else to do at the moment, so I'm just going to complete the job handle. And once you run complete, you can access the native array and see the results. You can take the result array zero and store it somewhere else, for example. So let me make another float resulting value and I'll stick it in there. Then you could also debug log the resulting value, result equals resulting value. Now there is one more important thing you don't wanna forget. We allocate a memory for our native array if you allocate, you need to dispose. So at the bottom of do example, make sure you invoke dispose on the result array. Now, if this works, we'll get a printout in the console. In the editor, make some kind of game object to store our mono behavior. It doesn't really matter what you call it. I'll just call mine example. Drag the example script onto this object. And then in play mode, well, look at that. Result equals five. Our simple job performed some very basic logic, but this shows how we could take the output of that logic and then do something with it. In this case, we just printed it out to the console, but pretty much it could be anything that you're doing within your game. So that is essentially the life cycle of a job. Instantiate, initialize, and schedule. Then you complete the job handle that you get back somewhere later in the method. To best utilize the job system, you want to schedule early and complete late. You will normally have a number of jobs defined in your application, and you could have multiple jobs just in this script or have multiple jobs split over several scripts. Once you invoke schedule, they all go into the job queue. Unity then does the magic of figuring out what jobs need to be processed and then splits the jobs between the worker threads if that's appropriate. A while ago, we mentioned that jobs do all their work on copies of their data. Just to show you how that works, let's try this. In the simple jobs execute method, set the value of A to something completely different. So let's try 23, A equals 23. And now let's try to log the contents of my job A from outside of the job. So in do example, let's debug log my job A equals my job A. Save this and try it out. In the console, you can see that the my job A is still showing a value of five. And that's because even though this float A is public, 
everything in the execute happens on a copy of the data that we're passing in. The only way to send the results out of the job is to use the native containers, which is the result array in this case. And that's part of the safeties that have been built into the job system. The job handle complete is another safety mechanism. Complete indicates that the job is done processing. Only afterward is it okay to access the native array. If you were to try to use the result array zero without invoking complete on the job handle, you would get an error. And you can try that really quickly if you want to. Comment out the handle.complete, save the script, and try it again. This time Unity says, hey, you didn't guarantee that the job finished. Why are you trying to access the result array? Okay, so we need that handle.complete, and now is all back to normal. And yes, that was a lot of trouble to assign one number to an array, but really it's more about understanding all of the steps involved. The idea is that you wanna structure your code so it can be broken into these smaller jobs, and then you can process more things at once using your CPU cores. Sometimes when you create a number of jobs, you need to count on certain jobs finishing first. We can establish a dependency in the scheduling using the job handle. Let's expand our example so we can see that in action. If I created a second job here, private struct, another job, and this just needs to implement I job, and I could just do something very simple. We can only have one public field, native array of floats. Again, I'll just call that result. It also needs an execute method. In the execute method, I will simply take whatever is in the first element of the result native array and then increment it by one. I want this to run always after the simple job. So whatever we set result zero to, we're gonna use this job to increment it by one. And I'm going to guarantee the order that these jobs run using their job handles. So first we'll need to instantiate the another job another job, we'll call this second job equals a new another job. Now this job only has one public field and we will initialize the second job result to the result array using the same native array. And the next step is to schedule. We get a job handle back, so job handle second handle equals second job schedule. And what we wanna do is pass the job handle from my job into the second jobs call to schedule. So we'll just stick in the handle as the argument, and then you complete the second handle down here somewhere. Now, if you do that, there's actually no need to complete the handle from the first job. You can actually comment this line out. The dependency implies that the first handle needs to complete before we complete the second one. Okay, so if you save the script back in the editor, and now in play mode, the resulting value is now six. Excellent. Now I realize that was a extremely basic example, but that is the workflow. If you want to use this system, you need to break your logic into jobs. Follow this syntax and Unity will handle the management for processing those jobs over multiple threads. In doing that, you could potentially boost performance. It wouldn't make any sense, of course, to use our example in real life. Each job would really need to be a significant task something relatively expensive to calculate. There is some overhead to creating jobs and distributing jobs and then getting the data back. So just bear that in mind. Now, because ECS breaks all the game logic into separate systems, it's almost a natural extension to want to run everything multi-threaded if you can. Now, certain things will still need to be run on the main thread, anything that has to do with IO, for example, but the C-sharp job system should make writing multi-threaded code much simpler. Not simple, but simpler. Now, as you'll discover, there's even a separate job component system type that you could inherit from, and it's almost like they were meant for each other. Now, on top of that, there is a cleaned up syntax for writing all of this jobified logic in ECS, reducing a lot of the boilerplate that you have to deal with. But we'll have to save that for another episode. And that's all we have time for. Remember, if you want to support the channel, check out the premium courses that we have at gameacademy.school. These are a great way to build a mini project for your portfolio or just get a refresher on your classic game dev skills. Okay, thanks for watching. Until next time, this is Wilmer. I'll be seeing you in the Game Academy.